So yeah, doing this book of yours. My aim was to make a book that would try to present as well as possible the Greek cuisine in total. It's a yeah, it's a good ambition. It's a high ambition, let's say. I think um, you've um, achieved um, a lot on, on this finite amount of pages, basically. That this is the thing because you know my my book initially was double in size from that, <laughs> so a lot of parts had to be cut. <laughs> yeah, or there's a lot of things to be said in the future. Maybe there's going to be something in the future. Maybe. <laughs> Hello, hello, hello! Welcome back to The Delicious Legacy, a podcast about food, about history, about traditional recipes, ancient cuisines, local dishes, and anything else um, related with food and history and culture. With me, Thomas Dinas. On this week's episode, I had the pleasure and the honor to speak with uh, Greek chef and author Carolina Doriti. Her brand new book, Salt of the Earth, Secrets and Stories from a Greek Kitchen, is out now. And so I really wanted to talk to her about uh, her experience growing as a Greek with Greek food and, um, of course, um, growing inside the kitchen, really, with her grandparents and, and parents cooking all the time, both professionally and at home. And, of course, the book um, tries to bring elements of the modern Greek cuisine, the traditional Greek cuisine, uh, how they marry together uh, and how they evolve and evolve all these years and what it means to be Greek and cook uh, with these ingredients since uh, ancient times. If indeed these um, recipes and ingredients uh, can be traced all the way to ancient Greece. So it was a really enjoyable and interesting uh, chat, which uh, I'm glad I'm sharing with you guys, because Carolina not only has been cooking with these ingredients for all her life and professionally as such, but also she was involved with uh, documentary work with Diana Kochilos, a Greek-American um, food writer, and they made documentaries um, for um, PBS, which is um, I'm going to put a link um, on, the, on this episode description so you can all check it out. But before we go to the episode proper, let me remind you that um, this podcast can only exist with your generous support. So please, 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 if you enjoy this um, podcast, go to Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Pocket Casts, Acasts, wherever you can, and uh, rate and review the podcast. It's really important because that brings, um, brings it more to forefront to other people. So if you like food, culture, history, uh, traditional recipes, and um, you want to share it with other people, do rate the podcast and review it. Leave a nice review, please. And um, on top of that, please share it with your friends and family. Just find three friends and three family members that will be interested in these subjects. And um, yeah, do share it. That um, makes the podcast going on and growing and reaching more people out there. Okay, so now let's go back to our chat with Carolina and also tell you that she's going to be in London between the 12th and 24th of November. She's going to be doing uh, some workshops in uh, Borough Market on the 17th and 18th, uh, I believe, of um, uh, November, the weekend. So if anybody's interested, um, can uh, find some more information about it. And then she's, be, she's going to be cooking on the 21st and 22nd of uh, November in restaurant Vori, a Greek restaurant in um, um, Holland Park, 120 Holland Park Avenue, W11 for UA. Her book, Salt of the Earth, is out now from Quadrig Publishing. And uh, now, let's go to our interview with Carolina. Carolina Doriti, welcome to the Delicious Legacy podcast. Hello. It's a great pleasure to have you here. Thank you for coming uh, to the podcast. And um, basically, thank you for your fantastic book about Greek food. <laughs> can thank you... you even more. <laughs> <laughs> great. Um, can you tell us uh, what is it called and um, where can one find it, first of all? Um, so the book is called Salt of the Earth. Secrets and Stories from a Greek Kitchen. It can be found on Amazon and on sort of everywhere. It can be found everywhere. 
It's a global release. Brilliant. Fantastic. So I want to ask you a little bit, um, firstly, about your background. How did you end up um, in the kitchen, of course, and your own uh, personal uh, history with food? How do you grow up uh, and all that stuff? So if you can tell us a little bit about yourself, that'd be great. I grew up in food and my family was really into into food in every way. I mean, they enjoyed cooking, but also their jobs were involved in food. Mostly my grandparents, both of my grandfathers and uh, my mother, who is also a, a food writer and a cookbook author. Mm. So I grew up into that and I grew up reading about it and researching, helping my mother research um, historically the food of Greece and the cuisine. And I hadn't really, I didn't study mm. anything about food. It wasn't my plan to go into that. Although I enjoyed cooking and I have been cooking since I was like six years old. Since I've, I was like 12, 13 years old, I started writing down my own recipes in books. But for me, it was something natural and part of my life and my everyday life. So, and cooking really always relaxed me. Right. It's a kind of, I mean, it's very, it's a, it's a way for me to express myself and be creative and relax. And it's a kind of meditation for me as well. Mm. So yeah, in a sense, you lived food, but you never studied or you never thought you're going to uh, be a chef or a cook or in a no, professional level. No, I didn't level. think of it. Mm. I studied other things, art related yeah, and um, media related as well. And then in 2005, I decided to quit the job that I was doing. I was working in a museum then yeah, and opened my own business. And basically that's when I started cooking professionally. And since then, I haven't stopped. <laughs> <laughs> Great. And where was that? Was that in Greece or in... Uh... Yes. Okay. So I decided to... I was living in London. I decided to leave it. I came back to Greece to be here during the, the 2004 Olympic Games because there, are, there were many interesting uh, job opportunities around art and museums and all that. So yeah. I decided to come back to Greece for a bit. Uh, but... I decided that, after all, the museum work was not what I was really into. And a friend of mine convinced me to just uh, quit my job, and I opened with her um, <laughs> a place here in Athens. Excellent. Excellent. And you haven't looked back since then? I haven't, no. But, uh, okay, I mean, I have changed a lot of different things. I've... I've done different things around food. Yeah. But up until 2012, I was basically working mostly, not mostly, I was working entirely as a chef, cooking both for private events, caterings, and at a restaurant. Mm. Yeah. Hard uh, work, long hours, and um, yeah, very busy schedule. Weekends, very evenings. Very busy, difficult nights because the restaurants in Athens don't close down very early. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> they stay up really late, so at least then. So it wasn't an easy life. So then I, my life changed because I had my son in 2013. Okay. And I'm a single mother. And um, that was a time that I really had to think what I'm going to do with yeah. my life and my work and everything so that I could be a good mom. <laughs> And that I could really continue doing what I knew how to do well, which was food. In 2016, I started working uh, with uh, Diana Kochilas. She's a Greek-American cookbook author. Yeah. I started working with her on, um, on a TV series on Greek cuisine called My Greek Table, which is um, it's a PBS production. Mm. So PBS is like the public broadcast broadcasting network of America and uh, North America. And of course, this pushed me to learn even more, to travel even more, to meet amazing people from around the country. Amazing cheese makers, amazing shepherds, amazing uh, yogurt makers, wine makers, olive oil makers. So it really both inspired me and educated me further 
on the on the subject and really pushed me to want more to show all these things I've learned, you know. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. That's that's the that's the thing, isn't it? Like you your eyes are open to all this different stuff and then you like that's amazing. I want to share it with other people. It's not just <laughs> keeping it for myself. It's, it, I mean, food is for sharing anyway, primarily. You share it with, with your best friends and your family and it shows love. But also you learn as well. And you, it's history, it's uh, family, it's tradition. And yeah, there's so much there that we don't know. And it, it's great, this, this uh, series. I, I, know, I know of Diana Kocilos uh, from the internet, of course, and reading a lot of her recipes and books and so on. And uh, yeah, I mean, she, I think she's done a lot to promote the Greek cuisine abroad. Yes, I think she, like when she began to do that, she was probably the only one who was mm. doing it, like to be writing books in English. Yeah, about um, regional. Yes. Uh, especially about the career, <laughs> the island. The well, Osamos. that's where she comes from, yeah. so it's very important for her to write about it. But it's been great. And, and, and since 2016, I mean, we're very close with Diane. We work together. We've done four seasons of that series, and um, hopefully there will be more. So, and I'm really proud to yeah. be the culinary producer of this show. Absolutely. It's been, you know, nominated for an Emmy. It's, it's a very important TV show on Greek food. Yeah, yeah. And in a, in a way, uh, I find it like like the, the, the ideal, um, uh, not job, but the ideal element to be involved with, right? Like mm-hmm. researching and traveling and talking about the Greek food and uh, showing it to people. Yeah, I think... I think in a way it's it's one of the best uh, things out there. Uh, so yeah, well done. I mean that's really important. Yeah, mm. I think it is. I think Greece is in a very good um, position right now to present the cuisine abroad in a better way, not just through my book, but generally. And it's been uh, so busy with tourism mm. the last couple of years, like extreme numbers of tourism and uh, especially in Athens as well like uh, people are discovering Athens <laughs> <laughs> finally <laughs> finally <laughs> so I, that's when I started writing yeah and that's when I started also researching I started researching about the regional cuisines of Greece and traveling a lot uh, around the country I also started working with um with uh, food tourism. Yeah. And then, you know, I kind of realized that there was a big gap in what was known abroad about the Greek cuisine. And that's why I decided to write my book in English so that it would be written directly in English by me and I could say exactly what I wanted to say without relying on a translation or anything else. Mm, Absolutely. I was going to come into that really soon, actually, about... um the perception of uh, Greek food abroad and the, the gap in the knowledge of what actually exists in Greece and what is known abroad. Do you find um, that, obviously, it was a lot bigger in the past, this gap? Yes, yes. it's do, true. Do you find that this is now kind of um, slowly getting bridged? And yes, it gets smaller definitely. and smaller, yeah. And so let's talk a little bit about this, actually. Let's talk about... Um, so about our experience of Greek food in the past abroad? Like it was, what, what was it for you? How, how did you find it actually? The Greek food in London, let's say. I want to be polite. <laughs> <laughs> okay, very diplomatic. Let's start with that, yeah. <laughs> but anyway, I mean, you know, when I started, when I first realized that most places back in the 90s, because now things have changed, mm. but back in the 90s, most places in London served lamb souvlaki and lamb gyros in a supposedly Greek place. It was very weird. I mean, I couldn't understand why would they do that since, Mm -hmm. you know, it doesn't exist in Greece at all. And uh, also, I mean, England is a country that has a lot of pork and people (laughs) eat pork. So I don't, I couldn't understand why, you know, lamb was the main, yeah, yeah, the main meat on on, on that kind of food. Generally, like there's a perception, I feel, abroad, of Greek cuisine as more Middle Eastern than it actually is. Mm. So, you know, people think hummus is Greek when it's not. Yeah. You know, it's not just about the use of lamb in a souvlaki. 
also, you know, things have changed in the Greek cuisine a lot. Yeah. And, and the product and, and Greek people are much more educated around the, the, the regional products and the different cuisines that you can find around Greece. Mm. Uh, it used to be very limited. And especially abroad, people thought that, you know, Greek cuisine is all about souvlaki, moussaka and tzatziki. Yeah, feta, Greek salad. And kind yeah. of that was olives, <laughs> Kalamata olives. And that was uh, the end of uh, the extent of the knowledge in Greek cuisine. And that's why I decided to do a book that would really explain the evolution of the cuisine mm. as well. Like from the ancient times, because Greece has a huge history. And when a culture is so advanced, like the ancient Greek culture was, the cuisine was also advanced as well. Because I th- th- these go hand in hand, you know. Mm-hmm. So I wanted to, to see what the, the ancient Greeks did. What has survived from the ancient Greek cuisine? What, like, there are things that are considered Roman when they are not Roman historically. Mm-hmm. They were ancient Greek and the Romans evolved them or yep. spread them out. So like, uh, like garos mm. and known as garum in Latin. The guts, the fish guts, fer- yeah, fermented fish guts, uh, yeah, with salt. There are a lot of things like that, similarly. For instance, you know, the, the cheesecakes, which are very historic. So I found the roots of cheesecake in ancient Greece, back as back as 800, 700 BC. So, you know, I mean, I talk about it in my book that anthropologists have studied cheese molds that they have been unearthed in Greece. And uh, they believe they even existed before 2000 BC. Mm. Okay, that's interesting. That's something I didn't, I haven't heard before. Yeah. We're talking about like easily 4,000 years. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah, really. Uh, so, you, you know, I mean, I, was, I, I started getting very, very interested in, in, in finding the roots of recipes and their history and how they evolved and all that. Mm. And basically, this is what I tried to do in my book. So I decided to divide the chapters into the main ingredients that have, you know... Existed in... Existed in the Greek cuisine for many centuries like the olive tree, the vine, the hive, the seeds and the grains, and how these were used wholly, what happened throughout history, you know, which grains came when, when did Greeks started growing rice and using it into their diet, which is now, you know, I mean, Greek cuisine uses a lot of rice yeah. today. Uh, things like that, and explain all that. Mm, yeah, yeah, that's correct. And um, you, this evolution... Obviously, you can, we can trace this evolution back to many, many centuries and we can see the modern Greek cuisine having their roots in the ancient culture, but also having um, borrow, borrowed a lot of elements from other influences. and uh, Elements from other cuisines, techniques from other cuisines, of course, you know, because you every day you learn something new. Yeah, exactly. But the nice thing is that in general, like... Uh, many uh, young Greek chefs are really reviving Greek cuisine in a very nice way and with very much respect towards the ingredients primarily because Greek cuisine really relies on ingredients. It's not about being very complex or using a lot of spices or difficult techniques or things like that. It's about using good ingredients mm. and, and kind of keeping it as simple as possible. Yeah, yeah. That's the thing that um, the ingredients, they have to shine. And there's a lot of great ingredients in great Greek produce, let's say, in modern day Greece, obviously. But um, it's not as well known as the Italian products, for example, the Italian olive oils and cheeses and so on, or the Spanish counterparts. That's... Well, it's about time for them to learn it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> So I think the Italians are really the masters of marketing Mm. and promoting, you know, their culture and and, and their cuisine, which, of course, you know, the Italian cuisine is magnificent. Yeah, we don't disagree on that. Yeah. Yes. I think the Greeks were more a bit of, uh, this is my personal opinion, like either they never cared enough in the past to promote that because they all were designated to become lawyers and doctors and Mm. something more fancy than cook, which was considered, you know, the profession of the uneducated. Mm -hmm. This is, I'm talking about 
um, until the 1990s. And this is my personal experience, right? Yeah. So and I think now this has changed a lot, a lot. And that's why things are changing too. So a lot of the producers of Greece until um, not too long ago, maybe a couple of decades, they didn't even care to produce and package their product in a nice, you know, bottle or package or whatever with a nice logo mm. and, and, and like export it. Nobody really cared. Usually what they did, they produced olive oil, they produced whatever, and they sold it in bulk to Italy. And the Italians were doing all the work for packaging and labeling and exporting. Yeah, yeah. That's a very, I mean, at least to me and to many other Greeks who care about uh, good produce, a very well-known story. Like Greek olive oil was sent in mass export to Italy and then Italians was, were exporting it charging lots of money as a as a great extra virgin Italian olive oil blend with the local olive oil and so on. It was happening a lot. You, you're right in the 90s for sure and probably longer than that, like up to 2000s and stuff. Yeah, I think things started changing when um, the economic crisis hit Greece. Yeah. So this happened after the Olympic Games, gradually, <laughs> slowly, but it, it, it was felt. <laughs> yeah. And then it reached its peak in uh, 2013, 14. Mm. And um, this was a time that a lot of people, younger people, people that had studied in good universities, that had uh, talents and were creative and couldn't get a good job because unemployment was really high. That's That was the time when a lot of these people decided to go back to their family business. Most of the family businesses around Greece are food related usually. Yeah. So, you know, they went back to the farms, they went back to their to their grandparents and they started putting their knowledge into food production, proper food production. What's the correct way to produce olive oil in the best methods to get the best results, to make olive oil medicinal? What's the, you know, dry fruits, the nuts, you know, go back to what their families had been producing, even, you know, farming. Mm. Um, there are companies that uh, farm and, and they only export. They don't even sell in Greece at all. I see, I see. Yeah. And with wine, similar case uh, as well. Of course. Wine. Great Greek wine. So this is very topical. I mean, Greek wine now, especially in London, is quite, quite um, well known. Finally, I'm very happy for this. A lot of great um, high-end restaurants they store they stock some uh, Greek wine as well. I'm really, really, really happy for this. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No, because Greek wine also had a big uh, gap. Although you know it's got such a long history, and most of the country is a wine region as well. Most parts of the country are wine regions. They the Greeks had lost the sophistication, like the knowledge of winemaking for a period before the 1950s. And then after the 1950s, after they went to study well, they went to France, you know, they got the knowledge. And now that's why the new generations of wine producers are incredible. Mm, yeah. So your, um, your exploration of the Greek cuisine and writing this book led you to go to all the different regions, right, across across Greece and the islands and so on. Can you explain a little bit about the listener who's abroad um, and they don't know much about Greek, not geography per se, but the different regions, the food regions, how, how would you categorize them in your, in your own um, way? First of all, I think the average person that is not Greek <laughs> and thinks of Greece immediately thinks of a summer destination, a beach, you know, a beautiful sea, water, seafood, octopus, and all that. Yeah, that's correct. Like the Greek island. But Greece is 80% mountainous. So it's a country that is, you know, I mean, like the cuisine of the Greek mountain is totally different to the cuisine that you would find in an area that um, has history with seafood. Yeah. And I'm saying it in this way because not, of, not all of the islands have history with seafood. Mm -hmm. Like the, the, the regional cuisines of the islands are not similar. There are islands that are mountainous and that traditionally you will see that they used more pork or goat mm -hmm. instead of seafood. Yeah. And going back to history, this is explained by the fact that there were pirates 
at the time. So a lot of people didn't go near the sea or the fish in some islands. Yeah, especially in the smaller ones. Yeah, the smaller ones, depending. If the islands were mountainous, they would really develop the mountains rather than the areas near the sea. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was a, it was a long period that people lived um, away from the coast in, the, in these islands. <laughs> so Yes, think of Tinos Island. I mean, think of Andros Island. They did not, I mean, even Sandorini, that everybody knows of Sandorini, you know, which is a, built a bit higher up because of the, of the landscape of the island. And the people were so poor. I mean, when I was traveling in Sandorini and I was asking about the local cuisine and talking to older people, they were telling me that nobody had money in Sandorini. They, they hardly ever ate any protein apart from egg. Mm-hmm. And the special dishes would include salted cod mm-hmm. on an island, salted cod. Yeah. So no which fresh. is not a Greek fish <laughs> at all. I mean, they have to import it. Yeah. So think of that. I mean, they were so poor, maybe they had no refrigerators. So salted cod was the solution. Mm. But I'm, I'm saying like, why? People didn't go fish, fresh fish. You know, they ate salted cod. Interesting. Yeah, yeah. Did you find that? Well, obviously they were poor, but I mean, did you find an answer? It was all about to do with them. Um... It was, it had all to do, it, it all had to do with poverty, really. Mm. And the fact that um, a lot of the older people, they were not, not every island had a fishing history. Mm. For instance, you go to Paros, which is not very far from Sandorini, and they have a fishing history. Mm-hmm. Uh, so, yeah, so we have uh, the cuisine from um, Sessi Clades. We have cuisine from, the, from Crete. Again, mountainous island, big island, with lots of different regions. And, um, and with lots of pork, lots of goat, lots of lamb. Cheese, uh, yeah. Snails. Again, a cuisine that, I mean, of course they use fish, that they, but there's so much variety other than that. Mm. And then we have uh, the mainland Greece, which is, again, very mountainous, generally mountainous. And you have Peloponnese, you have, uh, you have Epirus, Macedonia in the north, Thrace, all with their own distinct um, cuisine, right? And their own Distinct element. cuisine and distinct products, like... Greece has a region for saffron. Greece has a region for truffles. Greece has a a region for masticha. Super important Mm. product, you know. So a lot of people were like, oh, yeah, really? Greece produces saffron. Oh, really? Greece produces truffles. Like, these are not really known abroad. Yeah. Or the the, the number of, like, uh, different types of cheese. Greece has a huge history in cheese making. Extremely ancient. Extremely ancient history in cheese making, sausage making, and salami. They preserved everything yeah. in the past. So uh, preserving the meat was very important. Yeah. So salt and smoke, basically. Yes. And also like um, with the tradition of the... Um, I will try to translate it uh, <laughs> literally. I mean, it's it were pig slaughterings. <laughs> mm. You know, this is a, a tradition that is... Ancient, and you can see, still see it in some, in some villages around Greece, where they slaughter the pig before Christmas, and they preserve all parts. Yeah. Well, in the past, this happened for Saturn, Kronos. Kronos, yeah, Kronia, exactly, yeah. So long and long um, tradition and history of uh, of preserving the meat in many different ways. I mean, people know Greece more about the yogurt. <laughs> yes, of course, it is great. The yogurt in Greece is really fantastic, fantastic yogurt. But in fact, historically, I'm sure you know that yogurt had nothing to do with the Greek history. This is one thing that came with the Ottomans and yogurt came from Asia. Yeah. And obviously, so in your book, you are talking about these things, about all the different um, cuisines of Greece, in a sense. We have all these different areas and all these different regions that produce different products and they have different dishes and different influences. And um, yeah, I think that that's an important thing to say about um, Greek food that um, that is very varied as well as, as many other cuisines in the world. It's not just um, feta cheese and salad, Greek salad and um, <laughs> moussaka. Yes. Uh, I mean, feta is not even produced on, on, on most islands. Mm. They will have a Greek salad with the xenomizithra, for instance, that they make in the Cycladic Islands. Mm. It's not always feta in Greece. Yeah, yeah, that's the thing. There are so many other different cheeses. There's hundreds and hundreds of different varieties. And I think, uh, yeah, we are at least, yeah, we are reaching a point that... Um, Slowly, yeah, thanks to 
new producers with um, a lot of um, they put a lot of hard work and uh, people like you that the, they promote all these different elements of the Greek cuisine. And I want to go back. I'm not doing it only to promote it. You know, I'm doing it to record it. Mm. I think there are some things that need to be recorded. Also, recipes that are about to be lost. Preserved for posterity for the future, basically. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Like why lose the traditions? Mm. Like if you if you if you see in my book, you know, I had to put a recipe for a pie. Of course, at least mm. one. You know, I mean, and um, I put a couple of recipes for pies. I could have put the spinach pie, which is the most known uh, Greek pie. But I, I decided to put a very historic pie, which was a cheese pie that they made for New Year's Eve. It's a great recipe. It's a fantastic pie to taste. But at the same time, I'm also recording a recipe that is not widely known even in Greece. Mm. So I, I, I really believe that this is very important to, to preserve things like that. Yeah. As we said, yeah, your book, um, it's, uh, you, you've done it in a very interesting, a very different way. So you talk, you have olive a section. It's called olive, one about grain, hive, seed, vine, about grape and wines. And in that, you give to to the reader not only the history and the background and the evolution of each of these elements and how it interplays with, with the Greek cuisine, but also, obviously, the recipes, which is also important. And you have many traditional recipes, but you also have uh, recipes um, that you... That are modern. Yeah, modern. And, yeah, it's, it's, it's really great. I mean, one of um, the ones um, I remember now from, to my, from the top of my head is the one with the chicken and the fat. And the olives. This is a very traditional recipe. Yeah, yeah, this is a very Barduñotico. It's from Mani. And it's not from known. the region of Mani in the Peloponnese. Mm. It's not known very much. Not even in Greece. I mean, I'm from the north. I, I never, I never tasted it. Um... It's delicious. <laughs> you should make it. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. It's, it's, for me, when I was making this book, because really, I mean, the number of recipes I wanted to include were like too many. <laughs> And, and yeah, the book would have been huge. So I had to really cut it down as much as I could. And my main purpose in the selection was, first of all, to show the holistic use of the olive tree, mm -hmm. the vine, the hive, of, of these, you know, ingredients. Like how they even use the twigs of the vine. Yeah. How they even use the leaves of the olive tree, you know, to show that they used every part and that you can still use every part, even in modern ways. Mm. Like I have this recipe, I don't know if, you, if you've noticed it, the um, pomegranate, hibiscus and olive leaf. Yes, yes. Yeah. So then when I was choosing the recipes, I had to, to show all the different methods of using an ingredient in the cuisine. Like for instance, how can you use the olive? You can use it in a stew, you can use it in a salad, you can use it in bread, you can use it in a, like the use of the nuts, you know, how they can be used in uh, so many ways or the use of pasta in the Greek cuisine and the meaning of pasta in the Greek cuisine, which is huge. You as a Greek, you know how much pasta we use and how many traditional Types of pasta exist on different islands, you know, I mean, some parts of Greece were occupied by the Venetians for so many years. Yeah, like 400 years or so. So, yeah, you, you, there is an intrinsic link with uh, both the Venetian and Italian, more broadly speaking, cuisine, but also... Uh, but the exchange is also both ways. Yeah. Like the Greeks, I mean, a lot of the south of Italy or the east of Italy has people that come from a Greek line, mm. family line. As in Greece, like if you go to the islands, you see so many people, like the Cycladic Islands, almost everybody has a Venetian surname. <laughs> yeah, that's correct. My, yeah. my mom's name as well. I mean, you know, this is a, I think it's an exchange that happened both ways. Yeah, yeah, that's correct. So it's pasta, again, as, a, as an element, as a dried, um, dried wheat, preservation of food in a way it's very, it's very ancient it exists in one form or another from ancient times like ancient Greece and ancient Rome and that evolves from there and in other cultures of course and we have many different types of pastas like we have hilopitas for example which is like an, an egg noodle type of pasta very traditional especially egg and milk yeah yeah 
egg and milk, which is something we use up um, at least North Greece quite a lot. I don't know about. Um, Pchilopites uh, are yeah. used everywhere. Everywhere. Like Peloponnese, yes. Yeah, so it's kind of the thing that you use to preserve some food and to make it last longer and also use it um, as a quick fast food because they don't take too long to cook as well either. And also trahanas. Trahanas, which... that's another one. I'm really into promoting and, and, and letting people know about it in case they don't know already. Of course, tell us, tell us about oh, it, please. Oh, oh, there's so many ways to use it. Tell us what is trahanas, first of all, because I don't think uh, many of our listeners know it. Uh, trahanas, they also refer to it as an ancient uh, pasta. So basically, it's a product of fermentation. It's wheat that you boil in fermented milk and you then dry it in the sun and you kind of Chop it. Mm-hmm. And it's like a little um, balls in the kind of... Grainy, grainy, little... It looks a bit like bulgur in a way. Yeah. And then this commonly is used to prepare a kind of porridge, savory porridge usually. Yeah. Uh, with feta inside or other things. In my book, I decided to cook it as a porridge, but with a twist. Like I, I add it in a... Um, Tomato sauce. Yeah. Sorry, in a to- in a tomato soup. <laughs> tomato, tomato. <laughs> <laughs> in a, yes, like to add it in a tomato soup and uh, give it more, thicken it up, give it texture, add a bit of yogurt and a bit of feta, and, and make a really and turn it into a really comforting and um, delicious soup. Soup, yeah. It's um thick soup, you know, with a nice texture. Yeah, yeah, and it's. It's delicious. Basically, all you need is a bit of feta cheese, as you said, uh, and your, your twist with tomato. And it's very quick as well. It's something that you can have it in 10 minutes, I would say, in a modern kitchen. And um, and it's something you can easily find in, in, in London, actually, in the UK, yeah. abroad in general, because trahanas is not only used in the Greek cuisine, it's used in uh, many other cuisines, like in the Turkish cuisine. And Persian, yeah, Iranian cuisine, Persian, yeah, yes. Lebanon, yeah, you find... They call it Tarhana. Uh, yeah, tarhana, tarhana. Yeah. So yeah, it's easy to find. You can cook it very quickly and it's delicious and filling and warm as well. In the winter, when it's cold, you need something like that. It's very comforting and it warms you up like in an instant, I, f- I feel. <laughs> it warms you up, fills you up in a very nice way. Yeah, I think it's a great way. And, and, and surely it's because it's a product of fermentation it's far healthier than the typical pasta we know. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. That's very interesting. Uh, that's a very interesting thing to, to know, yeah. And um, I, yeah, I mean, I love trahanas. I'm, I'm praising it all the time wherever I can and I've converted my English wife to, to love it. Uh, she, she loves, yeah, she asks for the Greek soup. <laughs> she call it the Greek soup. Can we have some Oh, please, you must Greek make soup. her my, my recipe. I uh, will, will, yeah, yeah. That, that, that's on my to-do list uh, very soon. I didn't used to like tra- trahanas as a kid. I used to hate it. I think it was the smell, like that fermented smell of the milk and stuff that made me feel that it was horrible. And then It's also the ways of cooking it, I think. Mm. You know, I mean, I have a friend, she's in Australia. She got the book. She sent me a, a photo the other day of a trahana. Uh, I mean, she's Australian, but she's married to a Greek Australian. And yeah. she knew about Trahana and she hated it. Right. And she sent me this message and she's like, oh my God, I made your Trahana recipe and it's incredible. I never believed I would ever like it. It's amazing. And I'm <laughs> going to make it all the time. <laughs> <laughs> Brilliant. It's very rewarding to get messages like that. Yeah, yeah, exactly. All right. So talking about uh, recipes from your book and Greek recipes that, again, they're not very known. We just said about Trahanas and how you eat it. Another thing, very important for me, and not well known, is kakavia, the fisherman's soup. Yes, and very historic. Tell us a bit about it. So kakavia is the fisherman's uh, soup. It's a very ancient recipe that is traced in um, the cuisine of the Ionian Greeks. Mm. Uh, so it's named after Kakavos. Kakavos uh, was an ancient kind of um, cooking pot. Right. Where this was prepared. And it was actually prepared by the fishermen. The Ionian Greeks were settled from, you know, the ancient times in the coast of Asia Minor. So they had a very big tradition with, uh, they, were, they were very good fishermen. 
And um, so this soup was prepared on the boat with all the leftover, with all the little fish they fished and they wouldn't be selling, basically. Mm. But what's more interesting is that Marseille was founded by the Ionian Greeks. Yeah. In the ancient times. For Kians, I believe it was. Yes, actually it was. And, uh, and, and it is believed that this soup is the predecessor of Bouillabaisse. Exactly. We have a link here <laughs> with the French Bouillabaisse, <laughs> ancient Greece and Cacavia. Yes, but I have talked to people in Marseille. You know, so when I was doing all my research, I tried to talk with people, people mm. in Izmir, mm. Turkey. People in Marseille, people in different parts. So yeah, so he, he, that's historically that's the trace, the trace of uh, cacavia soup. Um, and today, and today's recipe, what does it include? What's the main things of uh, cacavia? Well, it's exactly the same idea. Mm-hmm. It's made on the boat with a small fish. I've talked to so many fishermen yeah. about it. It's so funny to hear the different <laughs> ways they do it. Even, like, I had some fishermen telling me that uh, they prepare it because this is prepared with very small rockfish. Right. Prawns, mussels, crabs, like, whatever whatever they happen to fish and it's kind of small or they know they're not going to be selling it for some reason. Yeah. They add it in the soup. And some fishermen put all of these, they tie them together in a in a pillowcase. All right. <laughs> they boil the whole thing. <laughs> <laughs> so I've had so many different ways of doing it, but okay, the classic way is to put it in a cheesecloth and just tie it well so that uh, the little bones don't, um, you know, right. exist into the broth. It's all about the broth. Right. Uh, they use simple vegetable because it's made on the boat. Everything is like cut into chunks because, you know, they're fishermen. So it's a very rustic soup and a very rustic way of making uh, the whole recipe. Mm. And very simple. Great. And yeah, like lots of olive oil, I suppose, and lemon. There's olive oil, yeah. <laughs> 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 Excellent. Yeah, that's a, that's a, that's another um, recipe. I think it should be more <laughs> out there. People should know about it. Uh, yes, yeah, it's a nice thing. So that's one recipe that um, I had in mind, and another one that I want to discuss because again, it has a lineage from ancient Greece. It's colliva, which you Koliva, write you yeah. write you write in the book about it, which I don't think I've ever seen in a cookbook before. <laughs> I think it's such an amazing recipe. First of all, I'm a huge fan of koliva. Huge fan. <laughs> I love it. Since I was a child, you know, uh, I used to love it. Firstly, it's, it's, we should explain what koliva is. Like, it's cracked wheat. Not cracked. It's whole wheat, wheat berries. Whole wheat berries. Uh, boiled. Yeah, you have to soak them. I mean, there's a process about it. And there's a lot of symbolism around this uh, dish. Yeah. Recipe. Uh, so you need to soak the the wheat like you soak beans you right. know, before you before you boil it and then you have to boil it and then you have to dry it really well and then um, and then you mix it with nuts and seeds and uh, these are symbols of fertility of abundance mm. I haven't had it for years actually I don't I don't remember when it was the last time I had it but I remember at least I remember, yeah, obviously a bit sweet. And I remember cinnamon as well. I remember spices. It's got cinnamon. It's got nuts. It's got currants, like the black raisins from yeah. Corinth. It's got um, pomegranate seeds, parsley. Mm, okay. Yeah. Everything is symbolic in there. You need something green. You need something um, fresh. You need the nuts. You need the se- sesame seeds. I also put sesame seeds. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, you have you have yeah exactly symbolisms about uh, life and about abundance and about yeah. Uh, I mean, this is rooted to the ancient celebration of Anthisteria. Right. Anthisteria was a celebration that took place around February March. Because, you know, the ancient Greeks, they, they planned their celebration according to the moon. Mm. So it wasn't always the same day. Yeah. <laughs> so this was a celebration where uh, they opened the, the wine vessels 
and they offered the first serving to Dionysus. But also it had different meanings. It was also a celebration that uh, is like a predecessor of Carnival slash Easter. <laughs> yeah. A bit. And uh, because they believed that during the three days of that celebration, so they believed that during those three days of that celebration, the dead would rise from the underworld. They kind of made special uh, symbolic uh, preparations. And on the last day in the temple of Dionysus in Athens, they cooked koliva, mm. which was not called koliva. It was called panspermia. Mm, panspermi, let's say. Pan, bit. everything, sperma, sperm, seeds. So yeah. all the seeds. And, and when they cooked that, they cooked it in honor of Hermes, the R god who led the dead to the underworld. Right. And everyone had to kind of eat that, I think, uh, in order to make sure everything runs uh, <laughs> well. Yeah. And the dead will go back to where they belong. <laughs> Yeah, it's it's amazing to find the traces of very ancient um, festive recipes and uh, dishes, which we still do and we still eat today. And yeah, it just, it's remarkable. It's incredible to see also how many ancient recipes were adopted and traditions yeah. were adopted by the Greek church, yeah. the Christian church. Mm. Um, okay, let's uh, move on to one of the recipes that... Um, Again, your book has a lot of traditional recipes and with a few twists and cooked really well. But for me, one of the recipes that, as a, again, as a child, I didn't used to like. I would eat it reluctant, reluctantly. But uh, I never cooked as an adult is yuvarlakia. <laughs> I know. I love it. I, mean, I love this recipe. <laughs> most of my Greek friends are like, what, what, what's wrong with you? I never liked it uh, as a kid. Really? As a kid. Uh, like, I find it uh, a bit meh. I don't know. <laughs> I will challenge you to give me a chance <laughs> and try my recipe. Yeah, I will. Yeah, I have to. I mean, it's... As long as you like celery root. Yeah, I love to celeriac. Like it. I use it a lot. So it's got a lot of celery flavor. I love celery. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so yeah, you are like, yeah, basically it's a meatball soup. In, um, and um, you use avgo lemon as well. Yes. And yeah, the meat is usually beef mince, right? Yes, beef or a mix of beef and pork, but I make it with uh, beef. Yeah. And obviously you have lots of different herbs and onions and so on and rice. And you, yeah, you make meatballs, broth, and avgo lemon or to bind everything together, that's thick lemon broth, lemon and egg broth. Thank uh, you for mentioning avgo lemon, because this was another thing I tried to do when I was choosing recipes that use avgo lemon. Yeah. Egg and lemon sauce. I tried to choose recipes that use uh, this kind of sauce in a different way, like I in see. a soup, like, in a, you know, in a stew on top as a sauce on top of dolmades, like to show how it can be prepared slightly differently. Yeah. To work well in different dishes. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Again, uh, yeah, that's something that um, it's very, very comforting. Again, it's a, another very comforting recipe dish in a sense of lemon, which yeah, you can use in many different ways, not necessarily just in a soup. Yeah, I'll have to, I'll have to make this recipe from your book now. <laughs> Please do. It's my son's favorite dish, and he, who is a very strict judge, yeah, has declared. <laughs> That I make the best you are like in the world. <laughs> Good to know. Good to know that. Other ingredients of the Greek um, of the Greek uh, table that you mentioned, um, chipuro, the, the, the alcoholic drink made from distillation of uh, grapes. After you make wine, obviously, the, so what's left the the, the grapes, chipura. Mm -hmm. That's another very Greek thing which uh, people abroad don't know about. And extremely popular. Mm. Chipuro is very popular in Greece. <laughs> Extremely popular. Yeah. I mean, everybody, it's like the Greek tequila. <laughs> <laughs> I like that. The Greek tequila. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I really, I really talk about, I mean, I really describe it like this often because, you know, also Tsipuro comes in uh, its young version, which is clear. Yeah. And, and the aged version, which is kind of amber colored. <laughs> yeah. The the age version, I think it's a relatively new thing, right? Relatively, yes. So they age it in oak barrel. It's it's similar to brandy. Yeah, it. yeah. It has. Yeah, traditionally, it's not what my grandfathers would do, but yeah, it's another another nice 
Creek it has project. become a very sophisticated drink mm. over the last years, Tsipuro. I mean, they make it from uh, single varieties of grapes, so it can be, it can taste totally different and with different aromas. And then, of course, they age it and depend, they age it in an oak barrel, hence the color. Yeah. And depending on how many years they age it, it can be very strong. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and yeah, uh, they... The not aged one, the one we, most people drink in the in the Cipuravico, it's something that um, accompanies uh, me- meze, small dishes. Yeah, it's a, it's, a, it's a drink for food. Yeah, and there's many, many uh, different um, meze that you can combine it with. Yes, it's a very broad, um, it's got a nice broad list of foods that taste very good with it. Yeah, and... Um, also, you can use it as an ingredient in your food, like I think you're mentioning yeah. uh, in the prawn saganaki, if I'm not mistaken. Or you're using uzo there? Prawn saganaki, I'm using uzo, but I'm using a lot a lot of the times when I make things, tzipuro. Also, a lot of old recipes use it in even cookies. Ah, yes. So, yes, there are many ways to use tzipuro. Mm. Or tzikudia in Crete, because I call it tzikudia. Yeah. Yeah, in Crete it's Chikudia. In the, like where we were uh, from the north, it's Chipuro. And Turkey, Turkeys have it. And they call it Raki. Well, it's the it's the Arab drink, the Arak. Yeah. That also the Turks got, also Northern Africa got. But it's a, it originally historically it's an Arab drink, mm. and it's made with uh, um, a grape distill. That they put fennel inside. Yeah, exactly that. Exactly that. So a lot of people, sorry for interrupting. No, no, no. no. But a lot of people confuse this drink, the Arak, and the different versions that Araki that you can find in Turkey or uh, Egypt or Lebanon. They confuse it with uh, Uzo. Yes. Because of the fact that uh, they taste. Anise. Like anise, yeah. yes. And if you put water uh, or ice, then it will become. Um, milky. Milky, yeah. Yeah, this is a reaction of the aniseed with the water, but it doesn't have to do. I mean, ouzo is not, it's another drink. Yeah. Totally different. Exactly. Ouzo, ouzo is like pastis in a way, kind of like the. F- yeah, I mean, it tastes similar to pastis or it's like sambuca, but sambuca is sweeter. But in fact, ouzo, the closest drink to, in, in the way it's produced to ouzo, is gin. Ah, okay. So, you know, you use a neutral base of a distilled drink, which is usually grain-based, like barley. And then you use, you know, it's it, Uzo producer has its own, his own, you know, like secret uh, blend of, uh, of, uh, of spices and herbs that, uh, that they use to make Uzo. So it's yeah. like a secret, top secret recipe, you know? Yeah, yeah. But... But there are two two distillations. First distillation, you put all the strong spices. Second distillation, you put all the milder spices or the herbs. Uh, okay, yeah, yeah. So, <laughs> so to gin. Yeah, 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 yeah. I should remember these things because uh, my best man, my best friend from school and my best man on my wedding, Stathis Georgiadis, wrote a book about Uzo. <laughs> really? Yeah. And so he knows much more than I do then. Like a, <laughs> a massive uh, <laughs> book, a tome. <laughs> 500 pages <laughs> big about Uzo. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I hope you can find it nowadays. Uh, I think it was released around 2007 in Greece. Uh, so, Stathis Yuriadis, and it's called Uzo. Magnificent book. If you can't find it, you come in London. I think I've got a spare copy. <laughs> I will be in London in early November for a while. I'm going to stay a bit because I'm planning to do some things then. Great. So, uh, yeah, I hope I see you face to face and uh, hopefully we will find out more about your... Um, exciting trip in London and what what what's been what are you planning? But yeah, that's for another time, I suppose. <laughs> Going back to the book, I wanted to also highlight the element of uh, the Greek peasant cuisine. Uh, a lot of the dishes they are very simple and very uh, the poor man's food. Basically, it's part of uh, what people ate. Um, like they're very recent- sustainable. I would like yeah. to point out this because I mean it's one of the things I talk about in my book, like the respect that old cuisines sold to their ingredients. Mm, and, okay. and the fact that they make sure they use everything. <laughs> true, true, yeah, yeah, every single thing. One of the things we can um, talk about, that is bobota, which is um, mm-hmm. a bread um, made with 
well, corn, but like not even the good f- corn flour. Uh, I, I remember my grandmother used to tell me about she was eating bobota during uh, World War II in, uh, when the, the Germans were occupying Greece and they didn't have... Uh, they took all the wheat, so the Greeks had no wheat. Yeah. Basically, and they had to use corn. Yeah, any 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 other. As you said, not uh, it wasn't easy to use this corn. Uh, in, in corn entered the Greek culture quite late, so I'm, I imagine that people had to learn all about it as well. Suddenly, mm. on how to use it, how to grind it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But one thing that existed also was nettles. So people used to eat a lot of nettles in soup, in pies, and so on. So that, again, that that's another poor. Person's food, basically. It's something that you collect. Not only nettles. I mean, Greece has a history with foraging. Mm. Yeah, Huge absolutely. history with foraging. From the ancient times, of course, because the ancients, of course, had to forage. But this uh, uh, knowledge of... I mean, I forage a lot. Uh-huh. Okay. And I would like to do something with foraging at some point, like a workshop. Mm-hmm. Because, you know, it really can happen anywhere. People tell me, oh, no, it's not going to be easy in London. Of course it is. <laughs> you can forage in the center of London, in a park. <laughs> uh, but here it's a, it's a tradition that it's passed on. If, if you're, I mean, my mother taught me how to forage when I was a child. Mm. My son is 10, he knows how to forage. Not everything. But he knows. Yeah, where do you forage? I forage in uh, Imitos. So, yeah, in the mountain in Attica. In yeah. the, yes, it, like, these are mountains around Athens. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. I forage in, uh, <laughs> there's a park called Sigru Park, you know. Right. Tima Sigru. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The yeah. Sigru Estate. This is a great place to forage wild asparagus. Mm, yeah, nice. Very, very... Beautiful, concentrated asparagus taste and very, very nice ingredients. And then, of course, you know, you I forage when I go to islands, I forage. Mm. When I travel, I forage. If I have the time, I try to forage. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. What are you... F- I mean, if, if you had to choose one recipe from the book that represents you and Greece, what would it be? What, what, what one recipe would you say, this is it? Oh, my God. This is a very difficult question. I know. <laughs> it, it, almost silly as well, but it's it's fun. It's a fun question. It's a very difficult question. And also I'm a huge lover of Avro Lemono, which makes me really... Uh, it tears <laughs> my heart not to say an Avro Lemono recipe. <laughs> but I think I have to go for the... With the I have to say the yemista, the stuffed vegetables. Um, the, the vegetables that are stuffed with rice and chopped herbs and baked in the oven. Mm-hmm. I think the smell of this food, the way I make it, because I make it with lots of different vegetables mixed together mm. in the same pan, and uh, I use lots of herbs, as I usually use in most of my recipes. <laughs> uh, I think this dish smells of grease. Great, fantastic. Very good answer. <laughs> Because <laughs> I, I I think yamista you can yeah the smell the aroma that comes when you cook in these days it's just grease yeah peppers tomatoes herbs the mint the parsley yeah the, the tomatoes that are cooked and they smell sweet yeah yeah <laughs> <laughs> that's that's the correct answer. <laughs> Excellent. Carolina, thank you so much for coming to the podcast. Thank you for talking to us about uh, your book and uh, Greek food in uh, more detail. And um, I hope um, we'll see you in London soon. And um, yeah, I'll keep my listeners um, tuned of any future events that you will do here in London. Great. Thank you very much. Thank you for having me. It's been uh, really great for me to talk about Greek cuisine with somebody that really knows it as well. So, thank you very much. You're welcome. Thanks for listening. I've been Thomas Dinas, and this was the Delicious Legacy Podcast. If you would like to hear the whole interview with the extra bits, please go to my Patreon and subscribe there. From $3 a month, you can get the episodes ad-free, early, and with extra content. I will leave you with a saying from the Greek Nobel laureate Odysseus Elitis. If you decompose Greece, in the end, you will be left with an olive tree, a vine and a boat, which means, with as much, 
you can remake her. It is not by accident that these three things are inseparable with Greece and Greek food. Olive tree with olives and olive oil, the vine with grapes and wine, and the boat with uh, the fish and the sea. Thank you for listening. I've been Thomas Dinas, and this was the Delicious Legacy Podcast. See you soon.